It's the third talk in our 2022 Invisible History series, and we welcome live from early morning California, Dick Holdstock, author of Again With One Voice, British Songs of Political Reform, 1768 to 1868, who will talk and sing to us about the golden age of the broadside ballad. And we also welcome balladress Jennifer Reed, good friend to the library. The library's events are, as usual, free. However, we'd like to encourage you to support us if you're able to do so. And there is a donate button on our website. OK, over to you. Well, thank you, Lynette, for keeping all this going. It's early in the morning here, as you pointed out, in California. But I am delighted to have been asked to speak, albeit remotely, uh, from the favorite uh, working class movement library today. It is also delightful for me to have one of my favorite ballad singers, Jennifer Reed, to join us to sing two Salford songs as part of this presentation. We all know that one form or another of social media has always played an important role in bringing about social change. Today, thanks to the web, we can express and receive political ideas from broader communities instantly. Up until the latter part of the 19th century though, the quickest way to get the word out was broad sheets, which were printed on cheap bits of paper produced by hundreds of independent owners of small presses. They were sold on the street by street vendors or at the affordable price for the average worker, many of whom could not begin to afford to, to uh, buy a regular newspaper. People consistently sang more in those days and were always regularly uh, interested in learning the latest song to pass on to their communities. Sales of broadsheets during this golden age of broadsides became the best source of new and old songs, requiring broad street vendors to become broadside ballad singers. Paint printers hastened to get new material to pass on to the other singers to sell. As people realized how Britain's outlandish political system was working to keep them from achieving a better life. Uh, government uh, printers added more material to print concerning the needs for reform of the hostile governmental system. Some songwriters either sold their songs to printers from small, for small amounts of money or printers copied from other from others. Same thing exists uh, people that want to sing these songs today. You don't get any money for it. These broadside ballads shed light on what working people really thought and said in those days. Today we can rapidly view the huge broadside collection of Oxford's Bodleian Library on the web. Rapidly and we can also rapidly uh, view the broadside collection at Oxford and then also the incredibly large and unseeable, unusable and usable collection of our subversive voice has recently been added to the web. Unfortunately, as we look back today at the struggles of earlier times to achieve some democracy, we can see that we still need to remain vigilant to secure more classless society. Further evaluation might help us to avoid making more of the same mistakes. Well, my recently published book, Again With One Voice, uh, British Songs of Political Reform from 1768 to 1868, includes 120 songs, mostly broadside ballads, from the turbulent hundred years that culminated with the Second Reform Act of 1868. Presented in chronological order, each song is described 
And when melodies were not included, melodies of the day have been chosen and provided for each song. Four songs from the book will be presented here today. Um, and they reflect on the concepts that are of interest to the working class movement library. To save time, we have uh, time several verses will not be sung. Please sing loudly the words to hide my aging voice. The first song is called A New Song. The source is from the Madden Library of, the, of Cambridge and it's the tune is Brighton Camp. I have to say that this is the only single broadside ballad that was favorable to Payne. It was in both collections of the, the, the library at Cambridge and at Oxford. And the reason is because it didn't say Payne in the title. So they got away with it. The whole song is called A New Song and it's all about Payne. And it gives us a lot of pain to have to think about the way people were being treated in those days. So here we go. In these disastrous, dismal days, our riot lord and libel, when men almost suspect the right, they have to read the Bible. I'll venture here to sing the truth, may you approve the strain. And as the way to please you most, I'll strive to give you pain. There was a man whose pain was pain, a man of common sense. Who came from Philadelphia here, his knowledge to dispense. He taught that man that equal rights as equal sons of nature derived by universal grant by heaven's legislature. He taught that on the people's will all lawful power depended. The government were for the good of the governed intended. And many are the wholesome truths so formed on reason's plan. He wrote within a little book and called it rights of man. The nation soon approved the book they read and understood it. A certain rose whom I name not with jealous aspects viewed it. And many a courtly sick of its page with terror traces for each man should have his right the roads should lose their play says when courtiers found his arguments could not be overturned his spirit still pervades the land and never will forsake it. We'll drink a bumper on a tomb, a tribute of affection, and wish the sleeping rights of man a steady resurrection. <laughs> well, now we can go on to the next slide. Uh, well, this broadside ballad was written after Tom Paine's 1792 conviction in absentia for treason. It only includes four of its ten more original verses. To some time, verses 
that mentioned William Pitt, Edmund Burke, and the turning of pain in burning of pain in effigy are removed. The typeface for this ballad sheet used the old S symbol, the long one, you remember? Um, uh, implying that it was printed before 1800. It does, however, show how well the ideas of the rights of man were in the minds of Britain's workers. While pain was burned in effigy in England, in France, they accepted him as a hero. Arriving there in 1792, he was soon appointed to the assembly. But at a vote in, in January 1793 to spare the life of King Louis the, the 16th made him a victim of Robes Pierre's reign of terror. He was imprisoned from December 1793 to November. It took the guillotining of Robespierre himself and the intervention of the American ambassador, James Monroe, for Bain to be released from prison. While conditioned, while confined, he finished his last major work, The Age of Reason, which criticized organized religion but recognized the existence of a supreme being. It's first of three volumes were published in both France and Britain in 1794. Shortly after Napoleon Bonaparte, as First Council seized power from the Assembly in 1799, his police began to harass Payne. Payne wanted to return to America, but it wasn't until the Treaty of Amiens in 1802 and the election of Thomas Jefferson in 1801 that he had safe, uh, was safe to do so. He arrived to a cold reception in, Bal in Baltimore, but after some time, Jefferson helped Payne to require a small pension, enabling him to live out the last years of his, uh, on his farm in relative obscurity. Now, here is Jennifer Reed, who's going to sing us a nice song. Two great songs, but of my favorite songs, actually. <laughs> cool. So this is the Hanloo Weaver's Lament. I'm really loud, so I'm just going to do a test line. And if it's too loud, tell me. So, you gentlemen and tradesmen that write about it will. Can you hear that all right? Cool. Right, okay. Here we go. See you on the other side. You gentlemen and tradesmen that write about it will Look down on these poor people, it's enough to make you krill Look down on these poor people as you ride up and down I think there is a God above will bring your pride quite down Yeah, sirens of England, your race may soon be run You may be brought into account for what you've sorely done you pull down our wages and shamefully to tell you go into the markets and you say you cannot sell and when that we do ask you when these bad times will mend you quickly give an answer when the wars are at an end you tyrants of england your race may soon be run you may be brought into account for what you've sorely done now you go to church on sundays and i'm sure there's no for pride there can be no religion when humanity is thrown aside. If there be a place in heaven as there is in the exchange, apostles they may not come near like lost sheep, they must range. You tyrants of England, your race may soon be run. You may be brought into account for what you've solely done. When we look on our poor children, it grieves our hearts full sore. The clothing it is worn to rags and we can get no more. With little in their bellies as they to work must go. While yours do dress as manky as monkeys in the show. You tyrants of England, your race may soon be run. You may be brought into account for what you've solely done. 
Now you say that Bonaparte has been the cause of all, and that we've got good reason to pray for his downfall. But Bonaparte's dead and gone, and it is plainly shown that we've got bigger tyrants and bonies of our own. Yeah, tyrants of England, your race may soon be run. You may be brought into account for what you've sorely done. Thank you. Well, I'm sure glad you sang that song, Jennifer. You sound like you belong in the, the area, right there. Uh, I can't do that no matter how hard I try, being originally from Kent, but living in California for about 60 years. <laughs> doesn't help. <laughs> Roy Palmer wrote that this song was written around 1805, about the time of Joan of Grinfield. Since all the available variations include reference to the death of Bonaparte in the next to last verse. It was probably written in the disturbing 1820s. It tells a convincing tale of working class resentment of the gap between the rich and the poor, coupled with the severe economic recession in 1828. These resentments blossomed into full-scale demonstrations and emerging union activity. This song t tells of the need for parliamentary reform as well, and it reflects on the loss of the people of... Well, huh, that's interesting. Uh, the people, the change of victory by Napoleon would have brought out. Ten years after Peterloo, the enfranchised workers of Manchester were still burdened by low wages, long hours, dreadful working conditions, and continuing price inflation. Child labor was the norm. Women worked long hours. Industrialists were making great fortunes while the workers starved. These hard times fueled the organization of new radical bodies to agitate for political and economic reform. The, na the National Union of the Working Classes held meetings to discuss the ideals of Tom Paine and Robert Owen. These beginnings eventually merged into the Birmingham Political Union. So Jennifer's going to sing another song now, and it's number 96 in my book, and it's called New Songs on the great demonstration which is to be held on Kersal Moor, right next to where the library is, uh, September 24th, 1838. So and it mentions Middleton, which is where I'm from. And you're from Middleton, good for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's have a do at this one. Um, you reformers of England and Ireland attend To this song I have made which has lately been penned Concerning a meeting which now has took place Our rights for to gain and to better our case The time it is come boys the workers begun to be free Or forever be slaves you Lancashire lads, this day is the time. Reformers will now both their hands and hearts join. For freedom and liberty now is the cry. To no longer be slaves, but like free men to die. So let us be steady, determined and ready when we meet on Kersal Moor. Classic ballad in that it has way too many words and really choice rhymes. From Macclesfield, Stockport and Oldham they've come Ashton, Rochdale and Middleton with music and drums Berry Bolton and Lee, it is a grand show Reformers all marching thousands in a row With banners so free and loud shouts of huzzah They join on Kersal Moor There's Field and Brave Atwood and Osler so free Fletcher Stevens, O'Connor, who all do agree. Reform, reform, it is needful, reform we will have.
For freedom's the cry of the honest and brave. Be loyal and true, boys, think on Peter Lou, remember this on more. So up and be doing in one union join, that the bright star of freedom may then brightly shine. Liberty shall resound from shore to shore, that Britons are free and our slaves no more. As our for reform, we shall weather the storm at this meeting upon Kersal Moor. <laughs> quickly muting. <laughs> Ah, well, you fit all those words in there a hell of a lot better than I did when I was working on it before you came on the scene. Thank you so much, Jennifer. I'm so pleased that you did both of those. We weren't sure at first, but it worked out eventually to, to just to do the right thing. Well, I want to tell you that um, massive crowds turned out for all gatherings dealing with primary issues of the day during the late 1830s, including the Poor Law Bill, the newspaper tax, the 10-hour workday, 10-hour workday, mind you, uh, the Corn Law and trade unionism. It was now time to see if people would turn out in such large numbers for a meeting dedicated to just the Charter. By the summer, of 1838, everything to establish an effective movement was in place. The Charter, democratically written by workers and some members of Parliament, called for universal male suffrage, a secret ballot, and property requirements, requirements to become a member of Parliament, payment for members of Parliament make considerable, uh, make each constituency equal in population and hold annual parliamentary elections. Unemployment and high food costs uh, made, made it clear that the 1834 reform bill had not improved the, the desperate lot of the working poor. The ideal place to hold the outdoor meeting was to, for Chartism was Kersal Moor, right next to Salford. And thousands did assemble there on September the 21st, 4th, 1838. The ultimate purpose of the meeting was to enable the people to elect their delegates to a national convention to be held in London earlier the following year. This ballot was a rallying cry for what is believed to have been the largest meeting yet of in support of the Charter. The fourth verse makes it clear that as with other Charter's functions, women were welcome at the event. There is ample evidence in all the accounts and reports of the active participation of women. The gathering included 20 bands some 200 banners, including many from Peterloo, an attendance estimated at the range from 50,000 to 300,000. And we know about all the demonstrations we've been on, they underestimated it tremendously. As long, if we'd have been there, it would have been more. Um, the exciting event, however, was a backstory by the time of the Crystal War meeting. The former Irish Minister of Parliament, Fergus O'Connor, had been publishing the Northern Star for 10 months and had rapidly become recognised and loved as the leader of Chartist activities in the north of England. A Congress was also seen as, as a leader of those who believed that to see adopt abortive of the Charter Chartist must be willing to resort to physical force. In contrast, the Southern leadership advocated moral force, really re relying on education and educational purposes. According to G.D.H. Cole, the real difference in 1838 was between those who held that the method of working class agitation should be educational 
and rational, a design to elicit the sympathy of men of goodwill in other classes and those who held that the growing classes, the governing classes, should yield nothing except from fear and that accordingly any and every method should be used to make the demand for radical reform as formidable as possible in their eyes. It took a long time for me to choose a song to end this presentation on the popular use of broadsides to help light the way to ultimate reform. A final settled finale settled on singing I finally, oh no, no, finally, I finally settled on singing a song that is still frequently sung, which was written by Ernest Jones, who remained to carry the banner of Chartism to its bitter end. So this is the song of the lower classes. Uh, the source is the Bodleian Library, and I have chosen the Vicar of Bray, which most others didn't. We plow and so we're so very, very low that we delve in the dirty clay. Till we bless the plain with the golden grain and the veil with the fragrant hay. Our plates we know we're so very low, just down at the landlord's feet. We are not too low, the bread to grow, but too low the bread to eat. Oh, we're not too low, the bread to grow, but too low the bread to eat. Down, down we go, we're so very, very low, to the hell of the deep sunk mines. But we gather the proudest games that glow, when the crown of a despot shines. And whenever we lack upon our backs, fresh long loads he deigns to lie. We're not too low to vote the tax, but not too low to play. We're far too low to vote the tax, but too low the tax to pay. We're low, we're low, we're very, very low, yet from our fingers glide. The silken flow and the robes that glow round the limbs of the sons of pride. And what we get and what we give, we know and we know our share. We're not too low. The cloth to weave, but too low the cloth to wear. Oh, we're not too low the cloth to weave, but too low the cloth to wear. Ah, low, we're low, we're very, very low, and yet when the trumpets ring. Oh, the thrust of a poor man's arm will go through the heart of the proudest king. Oh, we're low, we're low, our place we know, we're only the rank and file. Oh, we're not too low to kill the foe, but too low to touch the spoil. Oh, we're not too low to kill the foe, but too low to touch the spoil. <laughs> yeah. Well, Emma Jones remains famous today, mostly as the author of this song. The earliest copy of it seems to have been printed in his paper, Notes to the People. In 1852, current recordings today use several different melodies, but none I know use the melody of the Vicar of Bray as is chosen here. The anthem captures well the resentment of the British working class fell toward 
the middle class and the aristocracy. Juries felt was were from the upper class, but he was a, a Jones was from the upper class, but he was a Chartist who promoted its tenets long after uh, others gave up. After completing a two-year jail sentence from seditious speeches in 1850, Jones began publishing in the paper notes to the people and continued to earn modest amounts from his political writing. He stood for Parliament five times in 1847, 52, 57, 59 and 68 without any success. Not even the Chartists voted solidly for him. The faction fights within Chartism had destroyed its influence and bred deep personal animosities. Jones and others kept the concept of the Charter limping along and eventually combined resources with the Reform League to help achieve passage of the 1867 Reform Bill. I hope you will keep on singing songs that bring us closer to our ancestors who struggled to open our lives by democracy. My book only tells about a hundred years of that struggle that ends in passage of the second reform bill. The outcome of this long battle for reform made a difference by enabling some working men to participate in the democratic governance of their country by voting. The new electorate was twice as large as before, but still included only 20% of Britain's males, 20% of the males, no females, over the age of 21. The composition of the Commons in 1869 was 51.1% aristocracy or landed gentry, 24.4% businessmen, 13.2% lawyers, and 5.2% miscellaneous, like you and me. It's also essential that we keep singing these songs because we have yet to resolve many of the issues that still keep us from enjoying the fruits of the struggles of our ancestors. So, keep on singing, eh? <laughs> well, we're going to have questions and answers, I think. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you so much to to Dick and for and to Jennifer for uh, entertaining as well as educating us uh, song and history. Fantastic. Um, we've had lots of um, messages of appreciation in the chat, uh, which I can pass on to you both. Uh, has anybody got anything that they would like to comment on or ask a question about? I'll get on to yeah, I hope Jennifer will be available to add to questions, too. Yes. Hello. Uh, yes. Uh, she. Yeah. She's. She's there. Oh. Yes. Um, so yeah. Yeah. I will just. So thanks very much for bearing with us while um, I had. I think I had two versions of PowerPoint running, which was why various things went wrong. And I'm sorry you didn't get the full screen at the at the beginning, but I hope you were able still to sing along even when it was a, a slightly smaller image. Thanks very much for for bearing with it. I got there in the end. Um, now somebody has raised their hand. Yes. Yeah. Would oh. you like to? Uh, Sid Phelps, would you like to ask a question? Oh. Yeah, uh, thanks. That was great. Thanks, uh, Dick and, and oh, Jennifer. Yeah. Brilliant stuff. Um, I'm involved with politics. So I won't tell you which party, but uh, music is uh, a continued, um, continually helping me get through the day and, and keep fighting. I just wonder if either the singers would like to comment on how, how our history can help our future struggles, because, you know, the struggle carries on, you know, as we know. Um, any comments on how it might be relevant today? Thanks. Good question. Well, I, I think it's very relevant, and uh, it's been relevant most of my life. Uh, in 1964, we all had to go down the South and march with Martin Luther King. And we learnt a 
whole bunch of new songs down there. And I've been singing them every year on Martin Luther King's birthday here in my hometown with a whole lot, the whole town turns out to sing those songs. And so I recommend that we do that because it makes things work. Anything to add, Jennifer? Yeah, so I think these songs are incredibly relevant anyway. They're fun to hear. If you have a bit of personality as well, you can make them fly. But um, I've done a lot of work in Bangladesh, so you can basically trace what happened here, what happened in Bangladesh, and the songs are pretty much exactly the same, describing the same processes, the same issues that are related to industry. So, of course, they're still relevant because we're still living in this world that operates by these structures. Of course, they're still relevant. And you can get nine-year-olds to sing them and enjoy them. <laughs> And as a member of a choir myself, I have to say that the, the therapeutic value of singing and the, the, the communal nature of it is sort of, uh, yeah, to, to, could turn anyone into an activist, I, I reckon. <laughs> Barry, yeah. Yeah, I just want to say thank you to both singers here and to, the, uh, to you, Lynette, for uh, organizing this and putting this on. It's, it's lovely to wake up to in the early mornings here in Vancouver. <laughs> Uh, but I, I especially want to say that uh, uh, Dick's book is a true uh, gem. It's it's a labor of love, uh, beautifully put together, and it's a testament and a tribute to the power of music to affect change. And that will always be true. So, thank you so much, Dick, for putting this together. Thank you, Barry. Yeah, and, and thank you for sending a copy to the library, Dick. And we, we have it. We have a copy if you want to come and, and peruse it. Of course, you can buy your own copy from Dick's website. Well, that's great. Um, I I wanted to to uh, mention that uh, Barry also has a great book of songs out that he's travelled all over the world making, and I I uh, keep on enjoying it, Barry. It's really great. Well, yeah, and, and I'm glad that. Uh, that somehow or other we got that book together because it took 30 years from the time that I started collecting all these songs. And the reason I started collecting them was because I couldn't understand why it was that so many British people sang and enjoyed singing and talking about Napoleon Bonaparte. And so I was looking for pro-Napoleon songs at the at the uh, library at uh, the English Song and Dance Society, and uh, I was very surprised when I found a whole bunch of other political stuff right next to it, because uh, I didn't know there was political stuff that, that I could even understand or even bother to look to read in uh, all those old broadside ballads. So that started the whole thing, and I'm just delighted that uh, we were able to put most of the the songs as broadside ballads into the book. Do we have any more comments, any more singers? Anybody Hello. want to tell us about, about uh, singing you've been involved with? John, do you want to unmute yourself? John Baxter? Yeah. Hi, I, I wanted to say thank you to Dick uh, and apologize. I, I've, I've, I've been writing about the what you might call the three acres and a cow election of 1885, which was the first election when it, when the majority of men could vote. And there was a big kerfuffle about three acres and a, and a cow and more songs than you would want to shake a, a stick at, mostly called three acres and a cow. I know of at least 20 different songs all called that because that's land reform was what the election was about. But so I just wanted to say, in a way, song became more important after the broadsides disappeared because newspapers were used to publicize songs, music halls were used to publicize songs. People were singing songs in elections, about, around elections and around political reform, but more about what, less about getting the vote at, at that time and more about what they wanted from the elections. But, uh, but I, did, I, did want, I did want to say thank you to Dick for his book. It's a wonderful, I agree, it's a wonderful, wonderfully put together book. And I can see why it took 30 years, but well done. <laughs> John, I need to and just say, just tell us why three acres and a cow? What, what's the, what's the uh, crucial bit about well, it? They were radical liberals. It was before the, before the Labour Party or, or working people got the, had their own party. And there were radical liberals based around Joseph Chamberlain, 
at that time. He was a bit of a radical and he believed in that every working man should have the right to land and uh, livestock at three acres and a cow. And, uh, you know, there was a, this, there were other reforms they wanted. They wanted to disestablish the Church of England. They wanted to give free education to working people. But the thing the Tories focused on was three acres and a cow. And, and there, there, was, there was violence, there was riot, there was songs. It's a, a huge, a hugely, but I think that throughout the 19th century, elections were violent and full of um, people protesting and writing songs and singing, just like they do today on demonstrations. It's just we don't, we don't get to hear about it very easily. Sorry, I'm going on. No, John, I, I, I certainly had to see you here because well, I've seen you so many times now at the, at the, uh, the what are, F, S, E? T, S, F, Traditional Song Forum. Traditional Song Forum. So that you can't remember those things, T, S, F. And it's, uh, and it's a wonderful thing. Those that have not checked it out should really do that. Uh, John always has good comments there. And uh, I would like to make the connection between uh, Three Acres and a Cow to 30 acres and a plow, which was what they tried to give the black people in America after the uh, uh, Civil War. And uh, it, a lot of California was divided up with 30 acres and a plow. Um, and uh, there's a valley just right beyond where I live that was all settled by black people and, and uh, they did very well right out there. So, so I think Lincoln was ahead of, uh, uh, of the, as our friends in England that went for three acres in the plough. <laughs> but we've got a bit more room here than, than we have left in England, you know. We've got, we're also hearing on the chat about 40 acres and a mule. It's, uh, yeah, it's <laughs> we, 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 all manner of things. It all it all scans with the same uh, scansion, obviously. Yeah, all things. Yeah, so <laughs> all, all good, yes. <laughs> Stuart, you've got, you, you've got, so, so sorry, go on, Dick. No, 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 no. Okay. I agree with you. Right, Stuart, go ahead. Sorry, I'm, I'm muted now, I'm sorry. Right. Thanks, Roger. Again, thanks, Dick and Jenna, for wonderful songs. In fact, some of those songs I know from my um, so I'm collecting things, uh, Lancashire folk song albums from the, in the 70s, like Deep Lancashire and Out of Edge, with all the great that sort of movement in folk music at the time. And as somebody who hadn't sung until six years ago, when I tried to start, I've tried to sing some of these songs. Um, and so I now live up in North Shields. But I think it's maybe interesting that, you know, all the different areas of their different traditions. And up here, these are, uh, if anybody's heard of David Harker, who's done some really deep research into people like Ned Corbyn, who I had never heard of until recently. And obviously Joe Wilson, who did all the balladeering in, you know, they, they, they were, they were musical performers, but they also did political. They also sung about the yeah. society. They did strike songs and all that, all that gamut. And it was all going on, uh, you know, in different areas. And they all, we all, they all, every area seems to have their singers, I think. Yeah. Well, you certainly have some good ideas about that. Um, you know, um, it brings to mind one of the things that I'm really sorry about. And that is that in the final, after 30 years, the final rush to get everything to the printer, uh, I wanted to have something more about the north east of England. Mm. Uh, there's, there's not much in there about Newcastle and stuff like that. Uh, uh, and I love Newcastle. And I, and the, I go back to England, I go to Newcastle much more often than I go to sitting born in Kent. <laughs> <laughs> I can understand that. I can understand that. Dick. <laughs> I know. And, and, uh, and also I have another guy that was born the same year as me that lives up there. And he, he remained here as a member of the San Francisco folk club that I ran called the Castle Folk Club. His name mm. was was Louis Kellen, and it's now Louisa. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, yeah, no, yeah, no, yeah, no, Louis, yeah. Louis, for several years, was part of our, the, the floor singers yeah. at our club. And yeah. uh, so I have a tremendous joy about that. I finally found a really great song that I wanted to, to do, but I wanted to get somebody to 
give me some more feeling about it because I, I like to research a song before I put it in the book. And I asked for help. And one of the places I went to was the library and Lynette turned me on to Jennifer and she suggested that I uh, to ask her what she thought about it. She wrote back and gave me all kinds of great information, including the melody for the song and pictures from about that time and all the stuff. But it arrived about a day too late. So it never <laughs> got in the blooming book at all. And I, so I thought I'd feel better to rewrite the whole blooming thing so we can get those songs in. There's two or three like that. And uh, so it's so nice to be with Jennifer. The first time I've ever seen her in person is on the screen here today. So the, the other thing Jennifer. I think in the northeast, um, I, I'm coming from uh, myself. I'm from the southeast edge of Manchester originally. My wife's from up here, uh, but coming up here, the you know the, the Geordie that is such a deep dialect, especially in the 19th century. And a, couple, a few years ago, uh, there's a local playwright Ed Woff in the northeast did a play, he's done plays about Joe Wilson, he's done plays about Ned Corbin. And I know talking to him, they, they had to change the words of the song slightly on the Ned Corbin songs, because they're so, the lilt was so difficult for modern speakers to pick up, even though they were Geordies, even though they knew they had understood the, you know, the dialect now. The dialect in the 19th century was that was so, was actually different. And, you know, and that was, it becomes a complication, but uh, but as you say, the tradition still goes on because in Middlesbrough we have the Youngans, uh, a wonderful group of lads who sing ballads and recently did a wonderful thing on the, on the Stockton Brigade and the International Brigade in Spain. Well, that's great. I want to make sure that the word is out, that um, though I'm not very proud of the way I did it as far as the scene was concerned, but... Uh, I was muted. Well, did, did, sorry, did, am, I, am I muted? No, no, I, I, I thought I realised I was muted. Sorry, Nick. I was, okay, no, you I was were, rabbiting on was, there and I was muted. No, 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 no you, you, that was fine. fine. You, oh, you, okay, you, I must have just tricked it you, at the no, last no, minute. No, 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 we could okay, hear you. Uh, okay, so what I wanted to be, be sure to tell you is those of you that like music and like me cannot read music uh, will know that you can look on my website and all you have to know is the word dick hold stock and that gets you there just go to google and say dick hold stock and it'll come up right away it's my website and on that website is a list of uh, of material and you'll see the free you can download the the melody to every single song uh, to my warbling uh not like a linnet mind you but uh, but uh like an old bloke <laughs> well, that you, you've answered a question in the chat from, from David Jones. Will you be releasing a recording of the songs in the book for those who don't read music? So that Yes. Yeah. Oh, David Jones is there too. Hi, David. I didn't see your mug on the shots. He's another one that was born the same year as me. My goodness. Uh, he and, yeah, but he's younger than me. But David Jones is younger than me. Uh, <laughs> but I, uh, yes, that's it. That, that you, can, you can get that anytime by looking on there you might be disappointed when you hear what i sound like but i did it i got all 120 done after wow. i published the book i've done that i'm sorry could i ask a question the uh chat zoom chat does not work with the braille unit on my computer and okay oh, margaret, no sure Go ahead. Oh, she's wonderful hi margaret Hi, I should have joined on my phone i would because then i could have used the chat but we don't we like well, you actually too I guess, well, what one question, you mentioned the connection between the Northern Star and the Chartists, which intrigued me. And I'm wondering, I mean, the Chartists would have been a little bit after O'Connell, but were, were there connections between the Chartists and the O'Connellite movement? Well, the, the O'Connell uh, became a movement within the Chartist movement. Uh, okay. his, he, 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 the, the big issue was that he was not willing just to settle for nothing. He right. wanted to scare the shit out of those guys uh, to get them to do something because he took that uh, for the first uh, 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 change in, 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 the, in the, uh, 
laws of England uh, back in 32, but it, it, didn't, um, it didn't really accomplish what they wanted. But uh, the Chartists uh, were, were a very well-reformed organization, and O'Connell um, was the author. He was the one that ran the paper, the paper called the, uh, uh, the uh, what was the name of it again? Well, you, was it the Northern Star? Yeah, Northern Star, yeah. He, he was the author of that. Mm -hmm. Publisher, I should say. Publisher, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. The, the, there's another question. Anyone else is welcome to wave at me. You don't have to use the chat, but there is a, another question in the chat from Jill that some people have already answered, but let's let's see if either uh, Dick or Jennifer has, has any thoughts. Are there any song books or have you considered adapting yours for schools? It would be a great way to teach social history to children, which is greatly neglected in our schools. Uh, I do this in schools already, I'd like to say. Go on, say again, sorry. I do this in schools already. So usually we take one of the better songs that I say better, they're not better, they just don't have swearing in. And then um, write the last verse as a group about like today. So I like to do that in schools, it's nice. <laughs> right. Well, most schools are not that keen on an old rebel like myself. And uh, so that uh, I don't get to go very often, but I, I have been elected to the, to the city council of Davis, California. But the other thing I was going to say was, um, no, uh, the woman that did all the great writing of all the music in that book was a volunteer. Her name was June Nishimoto. And June is recovering from very serious eye problems right now. But she always wanted to do just a songbook. Uh, maybe a spiral bound that could be available for schools and I don't see why we shouldn't do that. Um, I, I don't know if my current publisher would be interested in doing that too but I see that since I put my book out to raving reviews from every possible source that we can believe in I didn't get too many from the Conservative Party, mind you, but other than that, I've been doing Good. very well. Uh, all from the Republicans, even. You know? I mean, I, how can I still be a radical when I believe in all that stuff that's in the book? That was a long time ago. That was not radical. Most of the stuff got taken up, over and done well. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, I would like to do this, check that out. and. Uh, if she gets better, I'm, I'm going to work with her to do that, to make it into a, uh, the, all these songs into that for, the, for them. But it's all there in the book. And uh, it, does it seem like it's expensive in Britain? But that book sells in America for $30, which is not real high, but there's a lot of books that cost a lot less. Even Barry Tudor's book costs less than that in Canada. Your book is worth its weight in gold, Dick. Oh, thank you, Barry. <laughs> it's nothing like as expensive as some of the books published on Folk Song, let me tell you. Oh, it, yeah. It, 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 it's relatively okay, it's, you know. Yeah. But compared well, to some, you, you can pay 50, 60 quid for some books on Folk Song, so. Yeah. Well, I'm uh, a great big fan of Oscar Cox uh, Jensen, and I love that book about Napoleon that he wrote. But it costs over a hundred dollars in America to be able to buy that book. It's still to this day, and uh, I just hope that, that that they eventually let loose so people can buy them. I think what it was was we were when we were students at the university, we had to pay a fortune in order to make it worth their while to publish those textbooks in those days, and they've never gotten over that. And so it's really terrible. It must be awful for a library to be able to buy some of these books at a tremendous rate that they want. Uh, but we are I think we're around about 24 pounds, something like it, 24, 25 pounds, something like that in America, in, uh, in UK. I, I've got uh, Roger here who wants to ask a question, make a comment. Go ahead, Roger. Uh, yeah, Dick. Um... And it's good to see you <laughs> this early in the morning. <laughs> well worth getting up for, I must say. And uh, boy, just to hear you singing like that, with it, it's fantastic. Um, 
I, I'm very glad that you did this modern modern book, you know. I, I never could find these sorts of songs in the 14th century where I was working. But <laughs> here's one question I've got. Um, you know, that would be a populist movement to my mind. But what's happened to populist movements? They seem to have been co-opted. And how do we get them back again? Well, I think if we started singing a lot more, we probably could get people more fired up to join together. Unfortunately, they're doing a jolly good job of that on the far right in this country. It's absolutely disgusting what's going on. I, my, my... Well, we have a few trucker. We have a few truckers in Canada too. We have too, a few truckers in Canada that have the same idea. Yeah. Well, that's. Or is that uh, a mispronunciation? Is. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody should know that's my brother Roger. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I figured that might be the, and you're, you're, you're sort of below each other thing, so you so really the resemblance is is, is very strong on the, on, on my uh, on my laptop here uh, yeah there's there's a, a, a police and crime bill in the UK at the moment which is a, a, there's a clause, potential clause about noisy protest uh, which is a, a very terrifying uh, part of it which uh, the, the idea that actually you could be arrested for for, um, for singing um, who knows? I would be glad to be arrested for singing. Okay, it's well, okay. Well, <laughs> I, I've never been arrested for anything like that. My my, my former wife, um, we were sitting on the tracks to stop the trains from taking bombs to the coast to send to Vietnam uh, during the Vietnam War. And we stopped the trains for two days, but she got arrested and I had to go home take care of the kids. So... Uh, <laughs> So, uh, so I didn't get to be arrested. There's still time. There's still time. I'm working on it. Yeah, I'm working on it. Um, I think we may be drawing to a close. I don't, Jennifer, have you got anything you would like to, to say to us as a any kind of summary? Yeah, my words of wisdom, may they spread far and wide. I don't have any. Um, uh, I was going to say to Stuart about um, Newcastle stuff. Have you heard of Tommy Armstrong, the Pittman's poet? Yep. And Ed Pickford is an absolute classic. Yeah, but yeah. yeah, they're nice too. I just thought I'd get my two cents in there. That's an American reference. Uh, I think, yeah, thank you for having me. It's been nice. Thank you. Yeah, it's been a really, really, a really good occasion. Yeah, uh, I think we are drawing to a close. So I will say thank you very much indeed to Dick and to Jennifer for entertaining us as well as as I say informing us and thanks to everybody else for for getting involved in uh, along the way that's always nice that we have people from many lands today uh, who, who are part of a uh, part of our event so that's brilliant so next week uh, is Wednesday the 2nd of March we're back at our usual time of two o'clock and we're welcoming Chris Hall to speak on his new book The Nurse Who Became a Spy about the remarkable Manchester nurse Madge Addy who fought fascism in Spain and France, 1937 to 1944. Today's talk has been recorded and will be uploaded to our YouTube channel shortly, and we'll be putting the link on the event webpage. A reminder again that our talks are, as usual, free. However, we would like to encourage you to support the library if you're able to. Thanks very much to those of you who do that regularly. One-off donations also most welcome, and there's a donate button on our website. Thanks again and goodbye. Take care. In solidarity, very best wishes from all at the Working Class Movement Library. Goodbye. See you later.